section 4.9, um, mechanical vibrations, part two. This is when you have a damping motion. Damping is the effect of reducing the oscillation. So this is the amount of force, which what? Reduces the oscillation. One of the examples of damping force is the shock absorbers under your car, which is a mechanical system designed to dissipate or to lose the kinetic energy, you know, the motion. That's what those shock observers are under the car. So in our experiment, remember we were dealing in part one of this video with a spring uh, and which um, has a mass attached to it. Suppose we let this mass go through a bucket of oil. So this is like here, we have oil, okay? So what's going to happen is that's going to reduce what? The amount of oscillation. So therefore, this, uh, this uh, phenomena is an example of damping force. Remember, I also said air resistance is also a, uh, what? a damping force, which is also known as a drag force. The other example would be hydraulic cylinder in a car's shock observer um, is a dash pot. Usually they are called the dash pot. Also used in carburetor for reducing the emission. And what is a dash pot? It's a device for damping shock or what? Vibration, okay? So in other words, uh, in hydraulic cylinder, you have a cylinder with uh, some oil with high viscosity and then that observes the what? Uh, the motion, um, the oscillation of the motion. So it's called the damping force. In general, damping force is denoted by F sub T. This is um, damping force. And it's proportional to some constants times velocity. So that's called a linear damping force. All right. And we use this kind of proportionality for small objects with low velocity. On the other hand, for large objects with high velocities, the damping force is proportional to V squared. V is the velocity, K is the constant. But in both cases, K1 and K2 are constant, but they are not equal. And they're positive number. And they are called... Um, coefficient of uh, damping coefficient. And if the damping force is proportional to the velocity square, that's called quadratic drag force. Okay, so they both are drag force. One of them is called linear, the other one is quad quadratic. Linear when you have the small objects with low velocity and uh, quadratic when you have large objects with high velocity. When we say large objects, we're talking about tennis ball. It's not like about a truck or anything. So that's basically what that is. So, um, so uh, remember, MA is equal to what? Uh, this is the net force is equal to uh, uh, force due to the spring and force due to the what? Uh, drag force. And they're opposite of, of course, uh, uh, you know, of the uh, motion. So therefore, uh, Fx is, Fs is minus Kx and Fd, we're gonna go by what? Linear drag force, which means what? The drag force is proportional. This means proportionality sign. H is called, it's a positive number and it's called damping constant. So it's positive uh, constant, okay? And um, we're gonna go with that scenario. So therefore drag force is proportional to the what? Uh, the velocity. So if you move these guys over to the left side and then divide both sides by the mass, you get this expression, which is X double prime plus H over M, X prime plus K over M, X sub T is equal to zero. So then again, this is a second order homogeneous linear differential equation. 
with constant coefficients. What we're going to do, we're going to make an assumption that let what h over n to be equal to 2 lambda, just for simplicity. Don't forget h is the damping coefficient and x prime of t is the velocity. x double prime is the acceleration, correct? So 2 lambda based on our assumption is going to be h over m. And omega squared based on previous uh, video is k over m. Remember this guy is not w, it's omega. Okay, omega. And it's what? Angular velocity or frequency, which is radians per second. So this would be radians per second, correct? So if you do the auxiliary polynomial, you get the uh, r squared plus 2r lambda plus omega squared equals zero. When you solve, you get these two roots, right? So the radicand, radicand, or sometimes we call this uh, discriminant, discriminant is what's under the radical, which is lambda squared minus omega squared. Don't forget two lambda is h over m. That's the what? Damping coefficient divided by mass. And omega is k over m, which is the constant of what? Spring divided by mass. So this discriminant in both cases is what? Omega squared minus what? Lambda squared minus omega squared. Now, we're going to take cases. If the radicant, which is the discriminant, is positive, the system is said to be overdamped because the damping coefficient is larger compared to the what? Uh, constant of spring. So the solution for that um, homogeneous differential equation looks like this, which is an exponential function. Do you see it? So it consists of two linear combination of exponential function. This equation represents a smooth and non-oscillatory motion. Notice there is no oscillation when you have overdamped. And motion dies off, in this case, uh, what? Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see now. Uh, comparing to the next case, faster. It faster dies off, it comes to equilibrium position than the other guy. Um, <clears throat> when lambda square minus omega square is equal to zero, the system is called critically damped. Since any slight decrease in damping force would result in an oscillatory what, motion and the solution is going to be what? e to the minus lambda t times c1 plus c2 t. Because remember, you get repeated roots, so that's where the t is coming from, right? Because the fundamental solutions are e to the lambda t and t times e to the minus lambda t. And so in both cases, you have common factor, but uh, one of them has a t because you get a repeated roots when discriminant is equal to zero. In either case, at most, what? The motion might pass through the, what? Equilibrium position once, all right? It could pass, the cross the equilibrium position once. So that's what these intercepts are. So, um, but this guy, what? Uh, dies off faster than, the, than this guy. But in both cases, notice there is no oscillation involved. Is that right? Because the solution has no sine and cosine in it. It's exponential function. However, if you get a complex root, that means the discriminant is less than zero, the system is called underdamped since the damping coefficient is what? Small compared to the what? Uh, spring constant. And the solution, as you can tell, it's going to have sine and cosine. Therefore, we're going to have an oscillation here. However, the motion is uh, going to go, what, oscillate, and eventually it's going to die off. And this uh, uh, curves, which, what, covers the maximum and minimum, what, um, oscillation is called envelope, which is equal to plus or minus, what, 
uh, e to the power of lambda t. But then again, remember the amplitude of the vibration approaches to zero as t approaches to infinity in all three cases, correct? So once again, we have overdamped, we have critically damped, we have underdamped. Case two is the ideal case. It's not too fast, it's not too slow. It's an ideal case in any design. So few observations before we do uh, what? Um, <clears throat> uh, observation, uh, observations about um, those three solutions. In all three cases, the situation depends on what? Relationship between mass, what? Constant of spring and damping coefficient. In all three cases, whether it's what? Over damped, critically damped, or under damped. In each case, the motion of the spring dies out as T approaches infinity. This motion is called transient motion or impermanent. Okay. And then we got something called resonance, which is the frequency of the forcing that would be this function right here, forcing function, is close to the natural frequency of the spring, okay? So when you have a forcing, uh, you know, function here, and the frequency of the forcing is close to the natural frequency, F, then uh, we have a reson resonance. In physics, resonance is the tendency of a system to vibrate with increasing amplitude at the same frequency of excitation. Once again, when the discriminant of what the roots uh, discriminant uh, in uh, finding the roots is positive, we have over them, the system returns exponentially, what to the equilibrium without any oscillation, it exponentially decays. Critically damped when you have zero, the discriminant is zero. The system returns to what? equilibrium as quickly as possible, then again, no oscillation. And for when the discriminant is less than zero, so you get what? Complex roots, that's under damped. And the system oscillates, what? Uh, with amplitude gradually decreasing to zero, you know, like it goes up and down, up and down, up and down, and then eventually comes to zero. And that would be like what? That would be like, um, at reduced frequency compared to what under dam case. So that's pretty much what uh, <clears throat> that's all about. So now let's see a quick example and go from there. A mass weighing four pounds is attached to a spring whose constant is two pounds per feet. So notice we are given the constant of spring, so we don't have to compute it, it's given. The medium offers a damping force that is numerically equal to the instant velocity. What does that mean? They are telling you what damping force is equal to. Damping force, they said, is numerically equal to what? Instantaneous velocity. So Fd is equal to x prime of t. Remember, x of t is the what? Position vector uh, um, function sorry, position function, correct? And x prime of t is what? Is velocity, correct? And t, of course, is the time. All right, so we were told that the medium offers a damping force that is numerically equal to instantaneous what? Velocity, okay, got that. The mass initially released from a point one foot above what? The equilibrium position. So what does that mean? Remember our convenience, uh, what assumption was, if the mass is above the equilibrium point, it's negative. If it is below, positive, okay? And if it goes up, positive velocity, going down, negative velocity, correct? So in this case, it says, the mass initially released, that's the initial position, a point one foot above the equilibrium position. So x sub zero is negative one foot. 
with a downward velocity of eight feet per second. So if it is going downward, the velocity is positive, correct? Is that right? Velocity is positive. So what does that mean? That means x prime of t is positive. It goes downwards. And initial position is negative because it's above the what? Equilibrium position. So these are my what? Initial conditions. I have to use these to find the c's. So here is my equation. Mass times acceleration plus what? Damping coefficient times velocity plus constant of what? Spring times the position function equals zero. So this is the equation for what? Harmonic motions with damping force. So you got to memorize this or remember it. Okay, <clears throat> if you read it along, read this, you would see a mass weighing four pounds is attached to a spring. So that means weight is, uh, you know, uh, four pounds. So we need to find the mass, okay? So four divided by 32 is one over eight slugs. So how do I know this is not the mass, even though it says a mass weighing four pounds? Because the unit of mass is not pound, is slug. That would be the unit of how heavy the mass is, which is m times g. And g is 32 feet per second squared. And weight here is what? Four pounds. Therefore, mass is one over eight slugs. So keep that in mind. And we already know what K is. It's two pound per feet. That's the unit for constant of spring. So we substitute those guys and we find the what? Uh, auxiliary polynomial, which is what? One over eight R squared plus what? R plus two is equal to zero. So when we solve, we get what? We get R is equal to negative four with multiplicity two. So what does that mean? That means the discriminant, uh, what was it? <clears throat> it was, <clears throat> uh, what was it? Lambda squared minus omega squared must have come up to zero, correct? So therefore I have repeated roots. So the solution is C1e to the negative 4t plus C2t t times e to the negative 4t. Remember, this doesn't really mean anything in real life. So you need to impose the initial conditions to find out what C1 and C2 is equal to. These are my initial condition. X sub zero initial displacement was negative one foot. Initial velocity was positive eight feet per second. So uh, substitute this guy over here, okay? And then take the derivative of this, correct? And then what? Impose this condition. At the end of the day, you're gonna get what? Um, C1 is equal to, where is it? C1 is equal to negative one, and C2 is equal to what? Four. So that's where this guy is coming from, yes? Negative e to the negative four plus four times t e to the negative 40. Okay, that answers the first question, which is what? Determine the time uh, at which the mass passes through the position. Okay, first, before we answer this part A, which is determine the time at which the mass passes through the equilibrium position, I had to find the position function first, correct? Position function. Okay, when does the mass passes through the equilibrium position? When what? Position function is equal to zero. I need to solve the equation for t. So if you set this guy equal to zero, you can factor out e to the negative four t. That would give you negative one plus four t equals zero e to the negative 4t is not zero for any value of t. The only possibility is if you set negative one plus 4t equals zero, which gives you t is equal to one over four seconds. In other words, right over here, this is how the graph of the motion looks like. t is one over four seconds. It 
crosses the t-axis, so that means it what? Passes through the equilibrium position. Now, part B, what is the position of the mass? Um, let's see. Uh, part B is find the time at which the mass attains extreme displacement from equilibrium position. So that means this distance, maximum distance from the equilibrium position. You know how to maximize a single variable function. You take the derivative set it equal to zero, you know, the uh, position function to find the critical value. The critical value turns out to be half a second. So that means what? At t is equal to what? Half a second. Is that right? Uh, the mass attains its extreme, in this case, maximum displacement from what? Equilibrium position. Remember, equilibrium is the t-axis, correct? Finally, C, uh, what is the position of, of the mass at this time? So you kind of what? Um, uh, replace what? T in position function with one half and you get e to the power of negative two feet. In other words, the answer is about 0.14 feet. So we would say the mass is approximately 0.14 feet below the equilibrium position, okay? So, um, so remember, because it's positive, so it's below, negative means above, remember? So that's basically how the graph of this particular harmonic motion uh, problem with damping force look like. I hope that helped a little bit to clear this section, which is about harmonic motions with or without damping force. Thank you.